Hello everyone, welcome to another lecture for drug delivery engineering and principles. I am Rachit and I am going to continue uh, what we have been discussing. So, um, for the last few classes we have now um, moved to our module which is on tissue engineering. So, let us see what we learned in the last class. So, basically we talked about tissue engineering in the last 2 3 classes about why it is important and uh, what it actually involves. And so, what it is essentially using material cells any sort of engineering concepts to um, restore the function of a tissue or uh, regenerate a tissue and um, similar applications. And among these there are several different classes of tissue engineering uh, that we have divided it into. Uh, we have discussed few um, in previous few classes. Uh, in the last class we talked about regenerating part of a tissue which essentially means that let us say if, uh, if some part of my lung is actually damaged. And let us say some part of the lung is damaged and uh, I want to regenerate this tissue. So, what are the different options that I have? Can I put, uh, can I generate this part uh, in vitro? And then uh, once the tissue has reached a certain um, function in vitro, I can put it back and uh, sort of suture it with the rest of the tissue to improve the function. Or what I can do is I can let the body take care of it. So, what I can do is I can just put the scaffold with some cells and let those cells uh, do the regeneration in the tissue itself, which uh, typically is a lot better uh, as in terms of integration with the tissue. And then the final thing uh, that I can do is I can just put the matrix and allow the cells in the surrounding area to migrate in and sort of populate this uh, with maybe the tissue stem cells or some other cells that can then restore and increase the function of the lung that was lost. And then the next thing we talked about was support function of a tissue. So, very similar to the previous case, but in the previous case our major goal is to sort of get back to the native state. So, as if uh, the person was healthy and so that includes both function as well as sort of uh, how um, the tissue architecture is. But in terms of support a function of a tissue, we do not really want to mimic uh, the native state. All we are trying to do is support a function. So, this could involve a fracture in the long bone, let us say. Let us say if this is a fracture and um, I am unable to sort of heal this uh, immediately, but the person needs to walk. So, what uh, you can envision is uh, with a surgery, this can be joined with let us say a steel plate. And uh, all we are doing, I mean our steel plate is no way is going to mimic what was the native state, but uh, it does allow the person to move around. So, the function is somewhat restored and then eventual healing will happen and hopefully uh, it goes back to the original state. And then we had a paper discussion. In this paper discussion, we were talking about uh, how you can modify um, a surface of let us say um, stainless steel. And in this case, we were looking at how the authors had modified the surface with uh, a polymer which is polyoigma. We have of course, discussed polyoigma before in our polymer drug conjugate classes where uh, we were saying this is an alternative to PEG which has uh, a lesser immune response compared to PEG. And uh, when you do that, uh, it prevents cell adsorption. So, once you do that, first of all, it prevents protein adsorption blocks protein adsorption. And if there is no protein that is adsorbing on the surface and then we know that the cells actually mediate uh, their attachment to the surface through these proteins. So, the cell adhesion is also blocked. And once the cell adhesion is blocked, most of the uh, tissue rejection or tissue sort of walling off, fibrosis. Uh, all of this happens through cell mediated pathways. So, if the cell is uh, addition is blocked itself, then uh, there is more chance that, uh, that, that um, the implanted material will not be rejected. And then what the authors further did is then modified it with peptide ligands, specific peptide ligands. So, in this particular example, they used a molecule called RGD, which has a binding site for integrins on the cell receptors. 
and once you bind through that you signal through that uh, you can uh, uh, sort of have the cell perform a certain function that is involved through that signaling and that way you can actually even uh, cause repair to happen even faster rate than what the native body would have done. So, these are just some of the strategies we discussed in that paper. So, uh, to give you further example of how um, something like this can be used and what are the current problems we are going to discuss another paper today and uh, that paper is essentially titled uh, simple coating of fibrinacin fragment that enhances uh, integration of uh, screws that are used for osteoporosis. So, let us start off first of all uh, what is osteoporosis. So, um, just a little bit of biological concept here. So, what typically happens in uh, a healthy human is uh, there are bones and bones are typically developed to be fairly sturdy and uh, there are few bones which are porous bones. So, um, especially this becomes important in cases of long bones. So, let us say if uh, this is a hip joint right. So, let us say this is a hip joint which it is and uh, all these uh, all these bones that are connecting uh, the different parts of the body um, they are essentially divided into two types of bones. One is called the cortical bone. So, essentially you will have bone thicker near the joints as you can see it is quite thick here and then it sort of thins out and uh, so in, in this also there is sort of a wall of a bone and this is called cortical bone. And then uh, inside this cortical bone you get this porous structure that you see here and so essentially all kinds of pores are running through here this is called uh, trabecular bone. So, let us write it on the other side. So, this trabecular bone is uh, basically um, nothing but it is to support cortical bone, um, it supports movement in all sorts of uh, three dimensions, uh, it has uh, it is not a very heavy support as the cortical bone is, but still it is a fairly uh, good support uh, especially at the joint areas. So, um, so what happens in osteoporosis is essentially um, this bone that trabecular bone starts to sort of thin off and as you can see uh, the um, the bone between the pores is sort of decreasing as uh, time is progressing and eventually it is becoming so thin that it is not able to support the whole weight. And so, what then happens is because now this is weakening the uh, as a result the support on the cortical bone is also weakening and uh, as as the person ages and this is this is related to the aging quite a lot especially in uh, female patients. And uh, what you will find is uh, then they will be very susceptible to fractures quite a lot. And um, typically this happens after the menopause, so somewhere around uh, age of 50 is uh, when this becomes quite severe and it is a basically a big big problem that uh, these, uh, these folks will suffer from a lot of loss in their, uh, in their bone strength and uh, they will suffer lots of fractures as well. So, this is a problem and so what is currently done as I briefly mentioned before. So, if you have a bone fracture um, especially on a weight bearing bone then typically what is done is we put some metal plates. So, let us say if this is one of my long bone actually let me draw it a little more representatively. So, let us say if this was the long bone and it suffers a fracture because this trabecular um, bone is sort of weak. Um, so, what is typically done is a metal plate is put in. So, because obviously uh, at this point this bone cannot bear any weight since it is sort of disjointed. So, what is typically done is a metal plate, let me draw it with another color. So, a metal plate of various dimensions and various strength can be put in and to hold hold the plate in place uh, screws are also put in. So, there will be some screws 
and I will be sort of punched into the bone to hold this metal plate. Now because of this metal plate being present uh, it can actually support the weight. So um, that is what is typically done um, however uh, with this procedure there are few issues and that has been mentioned here. So one is a uh, lot of the time what is found is uh, so this these screws are nothing but they are fixing the plate right they are fixing the plate in position So what is found now is that this fixation uh, becomes loose over time so maybe these screws are not interacting with the bone very well this cortical bone that we have and uh, and they get loosened and loosened over time and that sort of causes this uh, screw to come out and uh, essentially failure of the fixation and once that happens the patient is again in a lot of pain and cannot walk so um, that is a problem. So it is typically seen uh, as, as is mentioned here lots, um, lots of pain loss of spinal alignment is also seen that can cause even more pain and uh, the bone can also start to resolve further. So I mean in this case you want this bone to grow back but now what is happening is because of all this movement all this improper fixation what you will see is that this uh, screw is also chipping off the bone the bone is actually resorbing away from the screw and the plate. So it is a big problem in the field. So what you can do now to sort of prevent the screw fixation so essentially um, from what we can see here is, is if we are able to prevent the screw from loosening then uh, we can alleviate some of these problems. So some of the strategies that are being applied is uh, first of all is to use surface roughness so a lot of the time uh, these uh, screws um, if you zoom in let us say if this is a screw. Let us say this is the screw what is done if you macroscopically look at it it, it is becoming uh, people are making it very very porous. So now if I zoom into let us say this area what I will see is there are lots of uh, pores or maybe actually I will show a transactional view. So if I show a transactional view there is lots and lots of small crevices and ridges and what that allows is. Uh, the screw can then bind to the bone very well because the bone can actually then grow into these grooves that are present on the screw and it essentially gives a lot more surface area for uh, the screw to hold the bone onto. So that is one strategy that is being used. But then the problem has been uh, that even after so much of the research uh, it is not very clear as to what should be the surface roughness and topography that causes enhanced integration and whatever you typically see is, is fairly minor improvement it is not a major improvement. The other strategy that has been used is to use a uh, few um, molecules such as hydroxyapatite and uh, calcium phosphate these are essentially something that are natively present in the bone the bone actually likes the surface and they have been shown to actually promote osseointegration. integration. Um, uh, get the mechanical instability to go away uh, but then the problem has been that even with these strategies uh, there is still instability that is present and uh, they are sort of difficult to apply they are very complex uh, these coatings are not trivial it requires quite a lot of uh, um, uh, work to basically coat it uniformly and especially in a shape like a screw where you have all these kinds of ridges that are being present it becomes very hard to get a uniform coating even in these ridges and all so which is limiting the use and then another coating that is very widely used is bisphosphonates bisphosphonates are a class of compounds uh, that uh, have shown quite a bit of promise uh, with the bone uh, fixation and but the problem is that the coating procedures again are fairly complex uh, quite a lot of chemistry that is required uh, you have to modify the implants chemically in that causes them to have different properties maybe different oxidation uh, different amount of things that are leaching out and uh, there has been some risk that the bisphosphonate themselves induce some atypical femoral fractures in women uh, especially this we used in clinics quite a lot and it has been, she had been seen as some femoral fractures do start happening in women uh, although albeit at a low percentage but it is a problem so uh, 
these are some of the shortcomings of this uh, these strategies. So, then one of the strategy that this particular paper has shown is uh, to use uh, stainless steel plates and uh, develop a coating over it. So, we will talk about the coating, but let us talk about why these stainless steel plates are being used. So, stainless steel again is one of the major material that is used for bone fixation and there is several reasons for it. I mean as you probably are all aware of stainless steel is fairly strong material, it has a lot of good mechanical properties. So, to be able to bear the weight over uh, quite a long period of time. It does not really corrode much, so that is a good thing. Um, it is fairly cheap, so the implants are not very expensive. Uh, there are also implants from titanium, but those tend to be fairly expensive and then they have improved shear strength compared to the titanium as well. So, I mean again titanium is again a great material to use, um, so is stainless steel, but in this paper they are focused more on stainless steel. So, we will talk about that here. And so now what they came up with is the authors came up with an idea to use a small fragment of a protein which is called uh, fibronectin fragment. So, fibronectin uh, as some of you may know is a large ECM protein. And it's, it's, it's somewhat of a beaded protein. So, there are several domains in fibronectin um, that are connected together. And so, one of the one of the fragments they are focusing on is the fibronectin 7 to 10. And the reason they are focusing on that is that fragment itself contains a couple of major site. One is uh, then RGD site, the same uh, peptide that we talked about in the last class. And then there is also a synergy site called PHSRN and what this site does it, it promotes a particular integrin to bind to this RGD. So, RGD again is a little bit of promiscuous integrin uh, binding ligand, it can bind to two or three different types, but uh, this PHSRN promotes the binding of this RGD through an integrin on the cell which is called alpha 5 beta 1. Now, this alpha 5 beta 1 integrin has been shown that if the cells are getting signals through this particular integrin, it actually promotes bone formation. So, that is the whole concept that these authors have used here that can they develop some simple protein adsorption coating onto these material to which uh, when these uh, particular fragments adsorb, they will cause signaling through alpha 5 beta 1 and that signaling will promote bone formation rather than bone resorption at the site. So, that is what they have done. So, first thing they did they did is to quantify whether uh, these proteins can actually adsorb on the stainless steel coupons and uh, if so then uh, to quantify that. So, what they saw that the adsorption profile of fibronectin exhibited a hyperbolic uh, dependence on the concentration. So, this is again very similar to what we discussed uh, in a protein adsorption class. So, as you are increasing the concentration of your protein. So, this is protein concentration in mu g per ml, the adsorbed density is increasing. And why is this increasing? And it is the same reason because if you have a surface and let us say if the protein is shaped uh, uh, let us say like this, when it adsorbs um, and there is not uh, there is not much protein around it. So, other proteins will take time to diffuse through the media and reach the surface. It has time to sort of expand on the surface and occupy a lot more surface. So, maybe for this given area only two proteins are able to adsorb on it, whereas if you have lots of protein concentration in the surrounding. So, the diffusion time is less, then this protein cannot expand as much and maybe um, you can have four proteins adsorbing on the. So, that is why you see that as your concentration of the protein in the solution is increasing the initial concentration, the adsorption amount is also going up. So, very classic uh, like we had already discussed in the protein adsorption um, and then uh, about at 30 mu g per ml to 40 mu g per ml you start getting a saturated concentration. After that uh, the diffusion of the protein to the surface is no longer that the limiting step and at that point uh, it does not really increase it sort of plateaus out and uh, so that is what uh, is typically seen. So, then from this study the authors decided to go ahead with uh, a saturating concentration. So, for future studies they always used 50 mu g per ml uh, of a con protein concentration to coat on the surface. 
then uh, they basically looked at uh, how the cells behave on a coated versus an uncoated stainless steel surface. So, here uh, they have seeded uh, human mesenchymal stem cells, uh, these are stem cells that are also found in bone and uh, these are some of the cells that are responsible for new bone formation. So, as well as along with osteoblast and things like that, these differentiate to bone cells. So, what they have done is they have stained these cells with calcine which is a dye that stains live cells throughout the cytoplasm or in fact throughout the cell body. And what they see is if they do not have any coating the cells do stick to the surface they do like it and they have a certain uh, sort of a spread area. But uh, when they have coated the surface you see that the cells really like it and uh, they are really spreading on the surface quite a bit. So, um, and that is further quantified here that an uncoated surface the cell density is lower first of all. So, if you see equal number of cells you find more cells on this surface and uh, not only that the cell area is also higher. So, uh, more the cell spreading is much higher on these surfaces compared to the uncoated surfaces. So, the conclusion here is that the uh, feminectin coating will enhance cell addition and spreading on stainless steel surface. Then they figured out whether the actual signaling that they were saying that the fibronectin 7 to 10 is signaling through alpha 5 beta 1 whether that signaling is actually happening or not. So, what they did is uh, they blocked the cells with an alpha 5 antibody and so what is happening now is that antibody is blocking the binding of the alpha 5 integrin to your fibronectin coated surfaces and because of that you actually see that the cell density has decreased. So, they have tried blocking with other uh, integrins as well and they do not really show any effect but uh, only when they have alpha 5 then they start seeing some decrease in the cell density. And on uncoated surfaces they do not really see that in fact uh, when they block some other integrin which is present in quite abundant amount which ligand is present in quite abundant amount in the serum then they start seeing some drop but not as significant as here. So, the conclusion is that yes these cells interact with the fibrinogen coating surface through alpha 5 beta 1 integrin. Uh, which is what the authors wanted as it has been shown to then promote bone formation. Then they looked at whether these cells these human mesenchymal stem cells are actually differentiating into bone cells and whether they are producing markers for bone. So, ALP is one of the markers it is called alkaline phosphatase and is one of the enzyme that is used for bone formation. So, again they see that if you have if you have uncoated surfaces you get a little amount of ALP activity whereas, if you have coated surfaces you have much higher ALP activity and um, this is further quantified here. Then they actually uh, used it in a rat model. So, first of all they used healthy rats and showed that uh, if they put a screw in the bone in that uh, trabecular area of the bone then what happens and what happens after let us say one month when you take that bone out and try to pull the screw off. So, what they are measuring now is let us say if this is a bone you have put in a screw here. And now what you are doing is pulling it out while holding the bone while fixing the bone. So, um, this force that you are uh, sort of observing in pulling this out will give you sort of how, how adhesive this uh, screw is now on the bone. And what they do find is a significant increases at both 1 month and 3 month which suggests that actually the coatings do promote bone uh, adhesion of these screws. And then they used an overectomized rat model which is uh, essentially uh, these uh, female rats. Their ovaries are removed and then they are allowed to move around for a uh, couple of months. What that does is uh, because the ovaries are removed some of the enzymes and uh, uh, some of the hormones that are needed for uh, the bone formation especially the trabecular bone formation are gone. And so, you can see a difference this is basically a micro CT showing the trabecular bone mesh network on these rats and you can see that the amount of uh, bone present in the overectomized animal is much much lower than in the sham animals and this is again quantified here. So, this is the bone volume 
in the trabecular region. Uh, so, essentially mimicking what happens in humans uh, in cases of osteoporosis. And so, in these uh, sort of you can call them diseased animals, in these diseased animals uh, they did the same testing with the bone pull out and what they observe is uh, fairly very similar to what they saw in the healthy animals that uh, in over ectomized animals uh, you see uh, at 1 month and at 3 month the forces are higher to pull this out and the same can be seen in sham as well as um, the over ectomized animals. So, shams are essentially nothing, but they have not gone into surgery. So, they are age matched, they are housed together. So, these sort of animals mimic uh, everything except the surgery. So, you can potentially call them healthy, they have gone through a surgery, but they have not really uh, have any ovaries removed. So, what you typically see is almost 57 percent and 32 percent higher pull out forces at 1 month and 3 months respectively when you compare to the uncoated screw. So, what this uh, tells you is uh, that these coatings are fairly um, um, easy to use because all you have to do is essentially just dip these uh, screws into these coatings. There is no problem in terms of coating complex shape because the liquid will penetrate all kinds of shapes and uh, not only that they further show that uh, this actually results in a higher pull out force. So, notice how um, in over ectomized animals at 3 months versus the sham at 3 months you see that uh, the pull out forces are very different. So, an uncoated screw here we are talking about close to about 65 newtons, whereas this is almost 100 newtons, 105 newtons, which shows you how um, see where the bone is damaged in the over ectomized one. So, even in the disease model they are able to show an increase in the pull out forces as compared to the sham animals. And then um, finally, they uh, sacrificed these animals, took the bone out, stained the bones and did a histology. So, this is an histological image. So, here you have a fibronectin coated screw and an uncoated screw and what you can appreciate here is look how um, well this screw uh, is adhered to the bone. So, look at this all this pink staining which uh, is clearly showing that uh, nearly all part of the screw has bone over it. Whereas, if you compare it with an uncoated you see these uh, areas uh, where there is really no bone present uh, showing that uh, um, the bone does like uh, these coated screws and does uh, form on that surfaces compared to the uncoated screw. So, almost when you if you if you just measure this contact area you find that 30 percent increase in the bone in growth um, compared to the uh, uncoated screw in fibronectin 7 to 10 coated screws. Okay. So, we will stop here and we will continue further in the next class. Uh, see you then. Thank you.